That's why you read in 2 Samuel, it's either 2 Samuel 18, I believe it is, when Absalom dies, some of the saddest words in the entire Bible, David cries out, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, if only it could have been me, Absalom. What was that? That was the cry of a father who recognized that he lost his child and now it's too late to make a difference. The last comment I want to make if we're going to become a man who matters is we have to recognize that biblically speaking, most men in the Bible, this is critical, do not finish strong. Moses didn't finish strong. He didn't enter the promised land. David didn't finish strong. It was estimated that he was 52 when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Solomon, he was so confused over how he spent his life with chasing women and chasing things and chasing goods and everything was vanity and under the sun and if he always kept talking about is the futility of life and emptiness in vain this is a guy who had it all yet when he got to the end of his life he had to write a journal just to put his thoughts down about and he was saying man and you kept seeing this refrain under the sun under the sun. So as we conclude, I want to just give a preliminary highlight of some of the men in the Bible and what we as men can glean from them. And then in the successive weeks, we're going to start examining and unpacking their life in greater detail so that we can become men who matter. But I, I want to highlight these characters because this masculine side of these men, I have not seen articulated or rarely seen articulated. And yet as men, we can connect with it so readily. And yet it's it's really not discussed that often. So I'm going to give you some high profile characters and how they relate to men. Number one, King David life teaches us that no amount of public success can make up for being a failure at home. I mean, it's hard to have more public success than David. Even successive kings are, are addressed in relationship to David. King of the northern and southern tribes in 2 Samuel chapter 5, defeats Goliath, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Has people singing, Saul slain thousands, David tens of thousands. But no amount of public success can make up for being a failure at home. Do you think if he could have lost to Goliath, not been made king, and not had his song on the top 10 list, don't you think he would have traded all of that for Absalom to live one more day where he could have tried to reconcile? I mean, that you can feel the heaviness of him. Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, if only it could have been me, Absalom. No amount of public success can make up for being a failure at home. David's life also teaches us this, that David was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. And do we realize that could be anybody in this room all you need to do, don't let pride tell you, ah, I wouldn't do that, Brother Chris. <laughs> I remember I used to say things, this doesn't relate to moral issues, but I used to say things to my father when I was young, and he used to just look at me and smile, and he used to say, keep on living. <laughs> Have any of you ever had to revise some of the things you said you'd never do? He was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. Wow. 
And it wasn't just a one night stand. It was a lifetime wipeout. He paid fourfold. It started civil rivalry in his family. One son rapes his half sister, her brother Absalom. Amnon rapes Tamar. Amnon and Tamar were half brothers and sisters. Tamar and Absalom had the same parent. So Absalom now seeks revenge on Amnon, his half brother, for what he did to his full sister. I mean, this thing just starts spiraling. He was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. This is why we can never let our guard down. One of the greatest attributes, and I say it tongue in cheek about Satan, is he's patient. David was 52 when this happened. And it's just like, you know, like a soda machine, a nickel, then a dime, then a quarter. If you live in New York City, another quarter. <laughs> and another quarter, and that's what he did with David. This is why we can never confuse God's long suffering for indifference. Solomon, David's son, we'll talk more about these guys later on. Solomon's life teaches us this is so powerful that you don't have to be down and out. You can be up and out. You can be seven figures and out. You can be the most influential man in the world and out. I mean, if there was anyone whose life is Ecclesiastes is Solomon screaming in a megaphone at men. I did it my way and it didn't work. One of the scariest principles from Solomon's life, and I hope you're tracking with me, is Solomon's life shows us, this is so profound, that you can get exactly what you want from life. And apart from God's blessing, it'll only bring futility. I think it's the Amplified Bible. It talks about how, uh, I think it's, Ampl it's Ecclesiastes 6.2, I believe it is. It says, it's, and it's the Lord who gives you the capacity to enjoy. See, you can get things, but the question is, are you enjoying them? Proverbs 10.22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes one and adds no sorrow. In the Psalms, it talks about how the children of Israel, they got what they wanted, but it brought leanness in their souls. Solomon's life, man, he's screaming. This is the irony. You can get the cornered office. You can get the European car. You can get the gated community. You can get the trophy piece wife. You can get all of the credentials. Yet if God's not giving you to the capacity to enjoy them, it's sheer futility. So there are so many more characters that we're going to be looking at and so many more principles, but I just wanted to lay the groundwork on this subject matter, becoming a man who matters. And I believe as we look through these characters, look through these principles, it'll give us a tool to be legacy leavers and history makers. Amen?